call no man father. It is often asserted that we should call no man father at all. This charge essentially comes from uh, Protestant fundamentalists who have read Matthew 23, 9, where Jesus says, Call no one on earth your father. You have but one father in heaven. While I can appreciate <clears throat> that many individuals may read this verse on their own, it seems to me that the majority of people who take this to mean that the practice of calling priest father have first been told that by others upon being introduced to this verse. Effectively being told, did you know that while Catholics call priest father, Jesus says to call no man father? The seeds of misinterpretation have already been sown. As is the case with many other verses like 1 Timothy 2.5, this verse alone is memorized by a huge number of people, recited from memory, and used as a proof text. The problem with this approach is that it fails to take the Bible in context. It fails to recognize that individual verses must be read within their context, and that without doing so, the proper meaning of those verses becomes obscured. So let's take a look at the context. Matthew 23, 5 through 12. All their works are performed to be seen. They widen their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love places of honor at banquets, seats of honor in synagogues, greetings in marketplaces, and the salutation rabbi. As for you, do not be called rabbi. You have but one teacher, and you are all brothers. Call no one on earth your father. You have but one father in heaven. Do not be called master. You have but one master, the Messiah. The greatest among you must be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Is Jesus saying that we must not call anyone other than God the Father by the title of Father? No, the answer to that question is absolutely not um, the case at all. Uh, abs an absolute no. For Jesus provides an entire list of titles which, if literally forbidden, would make nonsense out of the rest of the New Testament where all of those titles are used to refer to individuals other than God. Jesus doesn't just forbid Father, but he forbids Master and Teacher as well. I will not take up much of your time in delving into all of the relevant examples, but a few will suffice. For this gospel I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, 2 Timothy 1.11. And he, Stephen, replied, My brothers and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia before he had settled in Haran, Acts 7.2. Are we to assume that Paul and Stephen never bothered to listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 23, 9? The problem is that Jesus spoke using the form of expression known as hyperbole, in which radical exaggeration is used to stress a particular point. If I tell my friend, you should have gone to this party, everyone was there. I am making use of hyperbole in order to point out that there were many people there. Hyperbole is alive and well in today's culture, and it was certainly quite prevalent in first century Palestine amongst the Jews. This typically does not make much sense to many fundamentalists, and this is not altogether surprising. For when one is accustomed to reading the Bible as a legal document containing explicit instructions and regulations, nuance is completely lost and some verses cannot be interpreted correctly leaving one with a bizarre reading. Some parts of the Bible are like that. However, many parts are not because, quite frankly, that is not the genre of most of the Bible. Jesus was often prone to make hyperbolic statements, statements of radical exaggeration, in order to make a point. Sometimes they can still be taken literally without resulting in the complete loss of their meaning. Jesus' instruction to sell everything and give it to the poor is not an absolute requirement, but greater holiness results from doing so. One can understand it as subordinating the earthly pleasures and goods in, one, in one's life, 
to obedience to God and love of others. And one can understand this being perfectly achieved for some through the complete renunciation of wealth. However, there are other times when a completely literal interpretation totally destroys the meaning, like in Matthew 5, 29 to 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go into Gehenna. Precious few Christians, particularly fundamentalists, interpret Jesus' words here in Matthew as an absolute, literal command. Jesus was not encouraging mutilation, and if he was, then the majority of Christians on the planet would probably be obligated to become blind amputees. No, Jesus is saying something different. In order to emphasize the effort we should make in avoiding sin, he speaks about what is better to do. One is better off as a blind amputee because the current physical state of our body is not as important as the current spiritual state of our soul. Jesus is using hyperbole, bringing up examples of clearly immoral actions against our body, to emphasize the need to remove from one's life those things which cause one to sin. Now, for another point, I myself have heard atheist debaters try to argue that Jesus was speaking literally when he said that if your hand causes you to sin, you should cut it off for the purposes of taking a stance against Christianity on the basis of incredulity at the straw man that has been created and propped up. Basically, make Christian doctrine sound ridiculous and tear it down from there. If this is the manner that hostile non-Christians approach the Bible, taking things out of context, oversimplifying what is written, and taking things with an extreme literalism so that the Christian position is ridiculed and viewed as unpalatable, as untenable, then why should any Christians choose to adopt the same approach?